Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 20, resuming our study in verse 24. So get your Bible, open it up if you can to 1 Samuel chapter 20. Remember, you can study all of the Bible with me at the Bible verse by verse dot com. That's the scripture verse by verse website found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. There you can study the entire Word of God using my audio Bible messages. Four series going back over thirty five years are archived for you there. And it's totally up to you. You can begin in Genesis, go all the way through Revelation or you can study any book of the Bible, any one of those four series, however you want to do it. Choose, click, and listen. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 24, so David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon was come, the king sat down to eat. And the king sat upon his seat, as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spoke not anything that day, for he thought something hath befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. No one said anything when David did not show up for dinner at the king's table that first day. I bet the tension was thick, but the tension was so thick that you could cut it with a knife. Everyone there, except Jonathan, knew there was a price on David's head, knew that Saul hated him without a cause and wanted to kill him. And Saul was uneasy because David missing was missing, but he didn't say anything. 27. And it came to pass on the next day, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said, unto Jonathan his son, Why cometh not the son of Jesse to the table, neither yesterday nor today? Saul tolerated one day's absence of David, but not two in a row. Saul asked, Why hasn't David been here? You know, it was a good thing that David was cautious. He knew that Saul was out to kill him. He got the hint when Saul tried to pin him to the wall with a javelin. His good friend and Saul's son, Jonathan, wasn't convinced. I guess being pinned to the wall with a javelin wasn't, in Jonathan's mind, uh, enough evidence that, that you were hated by the person who threw the javelin. And David was absolutely right to be cautious and go through this test of not showing up to see how Saul would react. When people who love God, like David did, have reservations about something, it is good to pay attention to those reservations. Spirit-filled believers rarely feel uneasy for no reason at all. 28. And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, let me go. I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now, if I have found faith in thy sight, or in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. Of course, that was a big lie that Jonathan told. I suppose he couldn't say, David is out in a cave hiding from you, Dad. He couldn't say that. That would break his trust with David. But it was still a lie. 
God's people are sometimes stuck in a no-win situation. Sometimes the best we can do is choose the lesser of two evils. 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Nice thing to call your son. Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own shame and unto the shame of thy mother's nakedness? Back then, I suppose today also, insulting a guy's mother was just about the worst thing that anybody could do, worse than insulting the person themselves. So I said, you're the son of a perverse mother. You're the son of an indecent woman. That was just a graphic way of saying, you're going against me, boy. You're acting as if I'm not your dad. So I was saying, Jonathan, when you side with David, that reflects badly on your mother. 31. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore, now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. Saul was not worried about Jonathan not inheriting the kingdom after he died. Saul was worried about his own popularity compared to the overwhelming popularity of David and the fact that God had chosen David to be king in place of Saul, not in place of Jonathan. In David's presence isn't the reason Saul and his sons will lose the throne of Israel. Just because David is around, that doesn't mean, that's not why Saul and his family will lose the throne. Saul and his sons lost the throne because Saul rebelled against God. Don't blame David for that. David didn't drive Saul off the throne. God did. David is simply God's choice to fill the vacancy. But as with Saul, sinners like to blame someone or something else for the troubles that they or their own sins have brought upon them. It's always somebody else's fault. And sometimes, if you're a modern evangelical, you don't use the word fault. You use a slick substitute. Oh, no, it's not an excuse. It's just a reason. Psychobabble nonsense. 32. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said unto him, Why shall he be slain? What hath he done? Saul wanted Jonathan to help him commit murder. Go find him. Bring him here so I can kill him. Jonathan asked why. If someone has the guts, the nerve, to ask us to rebel against the God of the universe, then we should have the backbone to look at them and say, why? What sense does that make? If somebody insists that you commit a sin against Almighty God, their creator, their judge, if somebody insists that you commit a sin against that person, Almighty God, then you certainly ought to have the courage to look them in the eye and say, why? What sense does that make? 33. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. Congratulations, Jonathan. Jonathan just asked a simple question. You say, what brought this javelin thing on? Because Jonathan asked a simple question. Why should we commit sin, Dad? Why should we murder an innocent man, Father? And Saul knew he didn't have a decent answer, so he fires a javelin. And his own son, Jonathan, tries to kill him, just like he tried to kill David. When we confront a sinner with the Word of God, they may get upset if they're not willing to repent, and they'll go after you. So be prepared. <clears throat> 34. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger 
and did eat no food the second day of the month. For he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. Jonathan was bothered more by the fact that his father wanted to murder his best friend David than he was at the fact that his father just tried to kill him too. You know, one bad person brings enough evil to the table to make life miserable for many people. Saul is unnecessarily making life miserable for several people. 35. And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little lad with him. Next morning, as agreed, Jonathan went out to signal David. David was counting on Jonathan, and he's not going to let David down. When a person does not do what they have agreed to do, someone is going to get hurt. Someone is going to suffer. So Jonathan would not be that unfaithful person. 36. And he said unto his lad, Run, find now the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. That was the signal, remember? And when the lad was come to the place of the arrow, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? And Jonathan cried after the lad, Make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's gad, lad, I should say, gathered up the arrows and came to his master. That boy knows where those arrows are, and yet Jonathan keeps yelling, hurry, 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 don't wait, it's beyond you. Must have seemed a little strange to that lad. Why is Jonathan acting so weird? The arrows are right in front of me, and he keeps urging me to go on and on and on, and to hurry, too. Well, I'm looking at him. In the world, is he that strange? You know, if something seems odd or out of place, there's probably something going on behind the scenes. Like here. Jonathan has more in mind than just arrows, obviously. Good to pay attention to unusual things and use discernment and pray about them. 39. But the lad knew nothing. Not anything, I should say. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. All the yelling about the arrows meant nothing to this boy. But David and Jonathan understood. Not everything is everyone's business. Sometimes we have to limit the people that we confide in in order to be successful. <clears throat> 40. And Jonathan gave his weapons unto his lad, and said unto him, Go, carry them to the city. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of the place toward the south, and fell on his face to the ground, and bowed himself three times, and they kissed one another, and wept one with another, until David controlled himself. These two great fans, friends, they were two friends in the Lord, Jonathan and David are only going to see each other one more time before Jonathan, just a young man, dies. That's his dad's fault. All this trouble for David and the early premature death of Jonathan. All his old man's fault because he's such a wicked, rotten, evil person. And it's really... Pretty sad because all the good that Don, Jonathan and David could have done for God as partners will never be. All the good times that they could have experienced together will never be. Evil people rob God's people of joy and fruitful times for the Lord. 42. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. For as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed 
and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. I don't know why Jonathan didn't go with David. doesn't say why he didn't. They were such good friends. They could have fought together. They could have survived together. But Jonathan returned home to his miserable, rotten, sinful dad, the king. Maybe Jonathan had other families, and I guess he had children. Jonathan and David, though, would not be there for each other, not anymore. But they had entrusted each other and each other's family into the care of God. And after reminding each other of God's care, David left. Until a person has enough faith in God to turn their friends and loved ones over to God for safekeeping, they will always be stifled in what God wants them to do because they'll think that they have to be around. Oh, I can't leave. I can't do this. What I feel God is calling me to do because my family, because my husband, because my wife, because my kids, because of my grandkids. Until they're willing to trust God with the people that they care about, they will not feel free to follow God to other places. James and John, the two brothers, the fishermen, who were in business with their dad, left everything, including their father and the business, to go follow Jesus because Jesus called them. Now, if they had not trusted Jesus and they had not trusted the Word of God enough to entrust their father to God's care, they never would have left and followed Jesus. That's what I'm saying. Well, study the whole Bible with me anytime you want to at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen. And if you would like to be a part of this ministry, pray for me and God's Word. And when you take a break from studying at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. And until next time, this has been Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.